Okay, so what I want to do today is to take you through initially some basics about how the issues of degrowth relate to biophysical and social reality. So what we'll start off with is base, what's the basis of the growth economy? What do we mean by the growth economy? Because clearly yesterday there was some confusion about what is growth and what is degrowth. And looking at biophysical reality and the foundations of that in thermodynamics and also in ecological economics and some of the work of George S. Q. Rogan. And then I want to look at the whole range of arguments that come forward, which are basically uh, I call the apologists for growth. People who uh, admit that there are problems with growth, but then go ahead with growth for a range of different reasons. Trying to create green growth, looking at there's a solution to climate change, looking at growth as the only way that you can alleviate poverty, looking at growth as the way that we can get leadership in society, and redefining development as growth. So I'll run through a whole range of arguments there. And then I'll finish up with looking at a different type of society. What's the alternative society we want? A social ecological system, a social ecological economic system. So what does that mean? How would we get there? Who would create the transformation? And I'll raise a range of issues and questions, which I think we should be discussing over the next few days, about what are the changes needed and what are the challenges that we, need, that we face in trying to get to a different world. So let's start off with the growth economy. What do we mean by the growth economy? How many people here have studied macroeconomics? Oh, quite a few, not bad. Okay, so, so you'd be very familiar with this diagram then. Basic macroeconomic diagram, right, which is the growth machine. Basically, it's the flow of goods and services, a material flow in one direction, matched by a monetary flow in the other. The faster this flow goes round, this exchange occurs between businesses and households, the faster those exchanges go, the higher your growth rate. That's basically what growth is. This model, which is the basic macroeconomic model, which is at the heart of the treasury models of all major Western governments, which has no banking and finance sector, by the way, also has something else missing from it. It has no inputs and it has no outputs. It's a totally isolated system. It has no relationship to physical reality. So this macroeconomic model describes an isolated system with no exchanges of materials or energy. Right? And this is the basis for our, our uh, model of growth and development. It's a fundamental failure to address biophysical reality. The economists are living in a total fantasy world. Right? And Eastern Europe has followed down this route as well, into this fantasy. What's the reality, the biophysical reality? The economy is based on resource and energy extraction on a massive scale, right? Mountaintop removal, deep coal mines, building dams, clear-cutting forests, exploring oil into the Arctic and, and other inaccessible places. Those resources then need to be transported and processed. So we have oil tankers, coal trains, gas tankers. We have massive oil refineries. On a, on a massive scale, we've got these oil pipelines, enough to go around the world many, many times. And the Germans are extracting their brown lignite fields like there's no tomorrow while claiming that they're green. And then what's all this for? Resource consumption. What are we doing with these resources? Lighting our cities 24 hours a day, sending rockets up into space, you know, having stretched limos, having cheap flights so that you can go for the weekend in New York from Budapest. And then there's also the military, of course, or Formula One racing, or robotics, all sorts of things. Right? So the resource consumption side of it is there. And it's very clear once you start looking at this basic social metabolism of the economy, you can see that growth is heavily matched by material flows. So this is a picture for the United States. And you can see the way that the cycles, you can see the 1930s crash, you can see the 1970s crash with the oil crisis, you can see the 1980s crash. Every time there's a crash, the material flows go down. When it recover, it goes back up. Material flows follow the growth economy. And then there's the response to this is, well, we're going to do recycling. Recycling will save us, right? Look at recycling in this picture. It's minuscule compared to the flows of the massive resources that are going through the economy. Very small amount. Then there's the idea that, well, we could address this through technology and innovation. If we only were to make our products last longer, then that would be the solution to the problem. We could continue on as normal. 
So we take a bunch of ordinary kind of household items, like uh, you know, more, more capital items, mobile phones, printers, PCs, kind of things that everybody in this room has. And you look at the lifetime. So we could make these lifetimes longer, right? Well, just take the mobile phone. Average mobile phone lifetime, four years. What do we do with mobile phones? We throw them away, right? So I don't throw them away. I haven't got one. But people who have them throw them away. So you look at the average lifetimes. And you see the USA, 1.7 years, UK, two. And you go down through all these countries until you get to the average with Germany on the average for the lifetime of the phone. So the problem is not the technology. It's not the innovation. It's not that we need durability. It's that we actually have created a fashion-conscious throwaway society right, where you have conspicuous consumption because your neighbor who's looking at his phone right now has got an outdated phone and you've got the latest model, that kind of stuff. This all relates back to the laws of thermodynamics. So this is the point about ecological economics and George S. Garogan and where he came into the picture. If we continue on like this, we have to make sure, we have to relate this to what the, the meaning is of the material and energy throughput. The first law of thermodynamics is the conservation of energy, right? So energy like mass can neither be created nor destroyed. What does that mean? It means that as we put all this energy and materials through our economic system, it's going to come out at the end in the same quantity in a different form, but the same amount. It doesn't disappear, it doesn't go away, it's not going uh, you know, into a black hole and never coming back, it stays with us, it's in the system. So what we have here is that the increase of inputs and materials of energy into our economy, the growth economy, as we've seen, which is heavily linked to the materials, increases the waste loads into the environment. That means that pollution is not some small problem that can be fixed with simple pricing, as economists tell us, it's actually an all-pervasive problem. It's part of the economic structure. The second law of thermodynamics is about entropy. How do we create order in our society? What do we do to create order? We extract resources of low entropy. We have dependent upon low entropy resources to create order. We take ordered substances and we create order in our society through using energy and materials. So order in economic and human systems reply, relies upon the exploitation of low entropy resources. What are those low entropy resources? Well, if we look at the three main sources of low entropy, it's terrestrial stocks of concentrated minerals, the solar flow of radiant energy, and the gravitational force of the moon, planets, and the sun. Right? Those are the main ones. How have we built our modern industrial society? Well, our modern industrial society is built on fossil fuels. It's very clear. You take the United Kingdom, the f one of the first countries to industrialize, and you can see the change from a basically wood and agricultural biomass system into a fossil fuel system, initially with the exploitation of coal, then petroleum, then natural gas. So today's economy, the growth economy, is built around fossil fuels. It is a fossil fuel economy. Right? So the industrialization and the growth economy are based upon fossil fuel energy. This is the biophysical reality. This is not an imaginary, it's not a story, it's not a description, it's not a social construction. It is a biophysical reality. And therefore, it's not very surprising that we have climate change, that we have greenhouse gas emissions going up. Because as we burn fossil fuels, we get gases from them. It's a basic you know, part of the physics of the whole process. So if you look at GDP, you get a correlation. You get a very direct correlation between the higher your GDP, the higher your growth rate, the more emissions you have in terms of carbon dioxide. You're burning fossil fuels. But it's not just a quantity issue. It's also the type of materials that we're creating in our society. So the move towards the green, sustainable, the smart green technology and innovative economy is actually a move towards the exploitation of more and more different types of materials and, and uh, types of processes in society, which then have impacts that go into the environment. So you start using batteries, you start using rare earth metals, you start using computer technologies, you're changing the types of things you have in society, use biotechnology and so on and so forth. So the smart green economy is also one that's heavily related around modern technologies, computing technologies, e-waste, toxic waste, chemical processing waste, so on and so forth. <coughs> so economies are not, as the economists describe, isolated systems with no relationship to a biophysical reality. They're open systems. The economic system requires physical inputs of material and energy, 
And in reality, the econ as the economy grows, the more materials are consumed, the more environmental degradation occurs, and the more pollution is generated. And where does that pollution go? It has to go into either air, water, or soil. And all we do with pollution control is shift it from air to water to soil, one or the other. It doesn't go away, it's not destroyed. So what about the economics of this physical reality? What about economists? Have the economists thought about this? Have they actually caught up with the story? Well, we go back, George S. Rogan was writing about this in the 60s and 70s and was founding the, you know, laying the foundations for equality economics and for the degrowth movement. And mainstream economists were also aware of this, right? So this is the 1970 book, a mainstream environmental economics book, and it says, in reality, these externalities, what economists call externalities, pollution, are normal and indeed inevitable. They're an inevitable part of the system. Or we can go to Cap and Cap, K. William Cap's writings, and Cap does not call these externalities. Rather, he would re-term this and, re and have a more realist uh, concept, which is about cost shifting. What happens in the economy? What is a successful economy? What is a successful company? What is a successful corporation? Its success is based upon the ability to shift costs onto others. So it can actually push these costs out and make others pay. That's what success is in the system. So it's a cost-shifting exercise, which is an essential part of the economy. Then it was interesting to, you know, discussing yesterday, last night in the plenary, what is the market economy? What was the Soviet economy? What was the former Eastern European economy? Uh, should we have planned systems or not? All systems are planned. There is no free market economy. The prices that are set in the market economy, the market system, are set on the basis of either excluding or including certain factors. So let's, let's have carbon pricing, because the economists tell us we have to put prices on pollution. If you put a price on carbon, you will change every single price in the economy. Every single price will change. And how do you set that price? Nobody knows, right? So it's going to be set by an administration, by economists, by experts. That's called central planning. The system is planned. Get over it, right? <laughs> so why do people push growth all the time? And there's various arguments that are being pushed forwards. Well, of course, as we heard yesterday, we're stuck in a structure. The structure of the economy is there, and therefore people want to maintain the structure, and therefore they make up all sorts of apologistic arguments about why we need to maintain the economy and, we, and that we can have a green economy. One of the core arguments that's been around for some time is the idea that we can, have, uh, we can convert the environment into a concept of capital. So we've got this green growth idea heavily linked into the reconceptualization of the environment as a, as a capital capital with a rate of return. The United Nations in particular has been very heavy on pushing the green economy idea and it's related to a whole bunch of concepts around value, what is value, the way that we conceptualize value and the way that we re redefine nature. So if we go through some UN documents from 2011, you can start to see what the green economy is about. So I highlight some of the aspects in red here. It's about goods and services. It's about goods and services which are not currently monetized, so they have to be fully integrated into the economic system by placing a value on them. All eco ecosystem services will have to have a value. This will encourage people to invest in them, and people don't do act out of moral concerns. They need to be rewarded. So the concept of Christian stewardship is redefined as something that you get a payback for it. Right? The green economy is a new development path that is based on sustainable, sustainability principles and ecological economics, right? Sounds good. But what this really means is that the economy is being put into the context of wealth creation and the environment is being put into the context of goods and services and natural capital. So compared with previous development paths, the uniqueness of the green economy is that it can directly turn natural capital into economic value whilst maintaining it and conducting total cost accounting. The idea is that you create value in economic terms out of the environment. You're not preserving the environment, you're not maintaining the environment, you're not concerned about the environment, you're concerned about creating economic value. And it's, the connection to ecological economics here is not the George Eskew Rogan, the thermodynamics link that I was discussing earlier. It's the American branch which has taken the idea of capital and taken the ideas of mainstream economics and transferred them directly into the environment. So we get 
human capital, we get natural capital, we get social capital, we get capital capital. Everything is turned into capital, right? And the advantage of doing this is that capital now is substitutable. So this is an approach going back to you know, Nobel laureate economists who were concerned in the 70s about discussing and addressing the environmental movement and their solution to the environmental movement is that even in the absence of any technological progress, exhaustible resources don't pose any problem at all to the economy as long as you can substitute something else for them. And if we have this concept of natural capital, we can start substituting so we get statements like this from a textbook, right, from the 90s. We can pass on less environment so long as we offset this loss by increasing the stock of roads and machinery and other physical capital, right? So you can get rid of the planet and you can all live in a spaceship, maybe. Yeah. All values in, this, in the capital approach then are equated. Everything becomes equated and you can just trade things off. You can destroy the environment and have more educated people. The next argument that links directly into this goes to the heart of the current concerns about climate change. So growth, as you would have seen hopefully from my introduction, is really heavily related to material and energy throughput, which is creating carbon dioxide emissions amongst a lot of other pollution problems. There, but what's happening now is that this whole picture is being turned on its head, and the economists like Stern and others are arguing that growth is not the problem, but growth is the solution to climate change. So what we have is a green economy, pricing and marketing non-market goods and services, internalizing externalities, correcting market failures, and providing a green and growing economy. Right? That's the argument. So we're going to have like this report, low carbon green growth, a roadmap for Asia and the Pacific, turning resource constraints and climate crisis into economic growth opportunities. Right? Every crisis is an opportunity. <laughs> and what this is based around is ideas of the greenhouse gas emissions reductions there can be new opportunities for increasing growth rates. We can set up global trading markets, we can have emissions trading, these things are worth billions, we can get financial guys involved, banking and finance sector creates jobs and so on and so forth. This myth is that disaster prevention is a good way to increase economic growth and prosperity. The more pollution we have, the richer we are. The more disasters we have, the better off we're going to be. That's the basic logic here. So the more we pollute the planet, the more growth we can have. The more wars and destruction we have, the better we're going to be because we'll have to rebuild everything. It's a fundamental flaw in economic logic, and it doesn't even match up with the basic economic textbooks. And yet we have Nobel laureates and Lord Stern pushing this kind of position. Climate change is good for growth, right? So the Stern report, how many people know the Stern report? Okay, good. So, it's been reprinted as a, as a better growth, better climate report in the latest one. But basically what the Stern Report says is tackling climate change is a pro-growth strategy. Right? It's all about growth. The new report which came out in 2014, which fed directly into the climate negotiations, is about the opportunity to build lasting economic growth. This is a report on climate change, remember. It's about competitive markets which are, uh, and with full costing, are vital to enable resource to flow where they're most productive. Full costing means that you have to work out all the damages into the future from carbons emitting, emitted now, you convert all those dead people in the future into monetary values today, and you stick them into a pricing model, and then you have an efficient allocation of resources. If the Chinese in the future are not so valuable as American golfing holidays today, then, you know, that just continue on. You trade things off. This better growth, better climate model and the whole approach of it, where is this coming from? Who is pushing this? Why is this on the agenda? Well, it's coming from a very specific political elite. This is the Davos group. This is the people who are in the top 1%, right? This, is, this report, which claims to be kind of a, coming from a committee of, uh, of well-meaning people, actually is two mayors, five ex-heads of state, two now working for the UN, 13 financiers and bankers, four leaders of international organizations, World Bank, IEA, OECD, and the trade unions, and Professor Stern. And then there's an economic elite behind this, a male, white male, middle class economic elite professors and Nobel uh, Prize winners. So this is being pushed from a very particular elitist position. And the real concern of the elite in Paris is summarized by that report in one sentence. 
In the long term, if climate change is not tackled, growth itself will be at risk. The next position is that growth will make us stronger, right? Growth and competition is the leadership race. We need growth in order to make us competitive so that we can all be winners. Win, win, win. The European strategy, right? So Europe came up yesterday in the plenary talk and, we, and people were saying, will Europe save us? Will Europe help us out of this? Will Europe offer a solution? Well, this is the European agenda, right? A European strategy for smart, sustainable, and inclusive growth. What is it about? More competitive economy, competing globally. Competition from developed and emerging economies is intensifying, in particular North America and China. Competition, you know, sustainable growth means building a resource-efficient, sustainable, and competitive economy, <coughs> exploiting Europe's leadership in the race. We must improve our competitiveness. We must compete. It's competition and, and consumer access to stimulating growth and innovation. It's all about competition. It's all about winning in this race. And of course, what does this mean? What is competition? Can everybody win a competition? So what we've got is an argument here that says that we need to increase the competitiveness of our economies to have a superior growth path to address environmental issues. Or as the Deutsche Bank CEO says, make no mistake, a new world order is emerging. The race for leadership has already begun. For the winners, the rewards are clear. Innovation and investment in clean energy technology will stimulate green growth. It will create jobs. It will bring greater energy independence and national security. But we might ask whose nation will be secure? Who are going to be the winners? You pick the winners. And who's going to be the losers? We can argue about who's going to win and lose, right? We can talk about peripheries and centers and so on and so forth. But one thing is sure. Where there are winners, there will be losers. And the real competition is about innovative technologies for securing resources and energy. This is the geopolitical situation of today. We're back into the geopolitics of the past. The comfort zone is gone. Right? So now we're, over, we're all concerned about securing those resources. And how do you innovate and get technologies to secure resources? You use military technology. Military expenditure, technology and production is an integral part of the competitive economy. Right? So look at the biggest military, military spenders. The biggest economies, the biggest spenders. The United States is by way out there in terms of its military expenditure. But you've also got the BRIC countries, Brazil, uh, China, Britain, France, Russia, Japan, so on and so forth, Germany, all pretty big military expenditures. Then there's this idea that growth is necessary because growth is development, right? We used to, in the past, use horses to plow the fields and to get... But now we have combine harvesters and you can get fewer people to do a massive more amount of work and jobs. And this is called productivity, right? The exploitation of low entropy resources embodied in capital. <coughs> Going back to the, where do we get the idea that growth equals development and the environment can be included is really heavily pushed through the Brundtland Report. So the Brundtland Commission set up in... Uh, the World Commission on in, in Environment and Development set up in 1983, headed by Gro Brundtland, the Norwegian uh, prim, Prime Minister at the time. This comes up with this de definition of sustainable development, which is widely cited. Sustainable development seeks to meet the needs and aspirations of the present without compromising the ability to meet those of the future. It's often cited as sustainable development and the Brundtland Commission as being a very good thing. It raised the agenda on environment and it was very much concerned about uh, developing countries and the poor. What underlies the Brundtland Report and the World Commission's uh, position is a growth economy. What they wanted was a five to ten fold increase in economic growth is recommended. Right? And far from requiring the cessation of economic growth, sustainable development recognizes that the problems of poverty and underdevelopment cannot be solved unless we have a new era of growth. 
And it's not just the, the less developed countries that need to have growth. No, we must maintain growth as well in the developing, developed e economies. And that growth rate must be at least 3 to 4%, the minimum that international financial institutions consider necessary. So the banking and finance sector sets the agenda of a 3 to 4% growth rate for the whole world, and the other guys have got to catch up by doing at least 5 to 10 times better than us. The UN is confused and contradictory in its positions. Right? It starts out from an agenda with early principles which, which express a lot of the concerns of, say, the degrowth movement and equal economics about the future, future generation, futurity, where are we going, about equity, concerns about injustice and social inequity, about public partici participation, the failure of democracy, about environmental integrity and the destruction of the environment, and maybe even bringing in intrinsic values of nature into the argument. And then what does it do with that? The actual emphasis of the United Nations over the last 30 years, utilitarian use of resources and the environment, economic market instruments, converting nat nature into capital and natural cap talking about natural capital maintenance, production and economic efficiency. That's what's happened. So for, since the 1992 conference in Rio, this is what's been in, in, incorporated and institutionalized into UN documents and approaches. And this is most clearly expressed last year before the Paris Conference, and, and actually referenced by the Paris Conference, is the new UN growth imperative. The United Nations General Assembly, in September, 21st September 2015, produced a, uh, a document called Transforming Our World, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Goal number eight, promote sustained, inclusive, and sustainable economic growth, full and productive employment and decent work for all at least 7% gross domestic product growth per annum in least developed countries. They want 7% growth rates, right? And how is this going to be done without destroying the planet and the environment and massive resource destruction? We're going to decouple economic growth from environmental degradation. Oh, no, we're not. We're going to endeavor to decouple. <laughs> so that's where we're at, right? What about growth as a solution to poverty? We're told that if we get the growth economy, everybody can become rich, well-fed, overfed. This is based around two myths which also link into the whole discourse I've been looking at. The first myth is income inequality is addressed by trickle-down, economic growth trickle-down. So the richer people get, the more money flows down to the poorer people and everybody goes up. And this is sometimes goes, this goes back to a couple of sentences in Adam Smith's very large book. The more economic the economy grows, the more happiness we're going to have in society. That's the other one. So we're going to have a richer society. People are going to be happier through growth. Now, I, won't, I don't have a lot of time to deconstruct these positions, so I'll do it very quickly. The first one, trickle-down effect, can be summarized like this. That's the reality of the trickle-down, and happiness, we're still not happy, right? The more stuff we have doesn't make us happier. So, Lord Stern says, opposing growth is reprehensible, naive, and will fail. In an interview with The Guardian, he said, to those who want to knock out growth from the objectives, I find they're close to reprehensible. I think to say that we should just switch off growth is to miss big aspects of what matters about poverty. And so it worries me. It's also politically naive. If you turn it into a pissing contest between growth on one hand and climate environment on the other and say you've got to choose, you're setting yourself up for failure. So this is a very strong statement against degrowth community and anybody else criticizing the growth, uh, growth uh, economy. But we can go closer to home for people who are also apologists for growth and who aren't necessarily in the, economic, the, the top 1% in the Davos crowd, but they may be bordering on it. Tim Jackson. Anybody know Tim Jackson? Anybody know the book? Yes, of course. Right. So, Prosperity Without Growth. I think this book should be retitled. It should be called Prosperity After Growth. Right? Because within this book is the following. Jackson recommends contract convergence. 
A key motivation for rethinking prosperity in advanced economies is to make room for much needed growth in poorer nations. Growth also substitutes in this book, right, for the broader concept of development and progress. So he actually says there is no case to abandon growth universally. No case. It is in these poorer countries that growth really does make a difference. So Tim Jackson's book, Prosperity Without Growth, is actually recommending growth for the poorer nations. Now, who are these poor? So who are the poor people that need the growth? Okay. Well, 1.7 billion people, 23% uh, of the world's population, <coughs> live in multiple dimensions of poverty, according to the United Nations. But the common way to look at poverty is to reduce it down to a single monetary metric, which is what's done all the time. And we, then we look at things like how many people are below a certain dollar a day amount, right? So the population below the international poverty line, which is now set by World Bank at $1.25 US a day, that's almost a third of the world's population, okay? The population in rural areas who are on less than $2 a day, 60%. But let's take something you know, which will get closer to Western standards of living. What about $10 a day, extravagant $10 a day, right? $3,650 a year is 80% of the world's population. The United States, in its 2016 federal report on poverty, has a threshold level of $11,880 as the threshold for poverty. So if we take the approach of Tim Jackson and we say that all the people who are poor should be brought up to a contract and convergence standard, we're talking about raising the standards of living through growth for over 80% of the world's population. Right? That is a massive growth agenda. It's no different than the Davos elite agenda or the Brundtland Report agenda or any other agenda. Right? It is a growth economy, a growth agenda. So this means that we have to totally redefine the way you think about things. The development of growth model, which has been uh, seen in China, and, is, and everybody says, oh, China's doing a great job. Look, they've lifted 600 million people out of poverty. What is that kind of model doing? What is the Indian model doing? It's the traditional old growth model based on fossil fuels, massive fossil fuel combustion, massive building of coal-fired power stations, resource extraction, pollution, land grabbing, both domestic and foreign, moving into Africa, moving into other countries, into poorer nations through imperialism, militarization. You need the military to take over those countries to secure your resources, to make sure that those people don't come into your country and try and get them back or rebel against you and so on. Forced urban migration. You shut down those people at the villages. You force people off the land. You grab the land from them. You force them into the cities. They go from having less than one dollar a day in a poor non-monetary economy, now they've got one dollar twenty-five, they're no longer poor. They live in an urban slum. The creation of an urban underclass, which was the traditional model that was done, this is why Dickens wrote about it in the 1800s in Britain, and Polanyi wrote about it as well. The denigration of traditional lifestyles and culture, these people are backwards, they don't know how, they can't read and write, they don't know how to communicate, and so on and so forth. The deconstruction of rural communities and ideas of community. The establishment of a minority of rich and the new middle class. That's the success. So, what we want is a different approach, right? Not the growth approach, not the growth approach through a back door, not the growth approach through footnotes in Tim Jackson's book for 80% of the population never mentioned. We want a different social ecological system. Now, the degrowth uh, community and the other uh, communities like Ecology Economics that are concerned about this kind of agenda are quite often described as being utopian. And we quite often get people like Yorgos, who I made nicely yesterday, feeling like it, almost that you have to apologize for being utopian, right? We are utopian. Well, they, that's fine. Yeah, we are utopian, but so is everybody else. There's nothing non-utopian about a growth economy. There's nothing non-utopian about an economic model that has no inputs and no outputs in biophysical reality. They're totally utopian, right? So what we have is two sets of utopian positions. The traditional utopian positions, the capitalist, neoliberalist, welfare economy, the sustainable development, the bioeconomy, the green economy. Those are all based around capital accumulation and the throughput. So they're all based around systems of cost shifting, as, as I mentioned with CAP, and individualism and high technology. The alternative agenda with the degrowth and other communities 
should be based upon, I would argue, scientific understanding of biophysical and social reality, as I've tried to out outline today. It's about community, appropriate technology, not high technology, eco-social eco ethics, bringing ethics back in. And we can discuss this and create this in terms of a scientific, concrete utopia. Right? Not some illusion, romantic idea. But romanticism is good as well. I'm not against that at all. But we can have a scientific utopia, work out how this can work. And it's no different than the other guys who have their own utopia. So who's going to do this? Who will transform society? Right? This is the big issue. So the traditional argument is this. The choice is yours. Okay? And the choice is defined, as we heard yesterday with the, you know, the desires of the Eastern Bloc to come into Western Europe, the choice is defined in terms of consumerism, choosing products, right? having more to choose on the shelf, not queuing for bananas and oranges. This is the classic liberal position, is that the individual is the power in society. Everything is individualistic. It's the same thing in mainstream economics and neoclassical economics. So if you add markets into the way that you can satisfy individuals, then you've got neoliberalism, the freedom to choose in the marketplace. And this then becomes incorporated into human psychology so that people believe their freedom is defined by their ability to choose in the marketplace. And if you take away the market, then they feel they've lost their freedom. So it pretends the individual has full volitional control. This is great, isn't it? Because in this political system, what that means is, if there's any failures, it's your fault. Because you didn't buy the right products in the marketplace. If only you had bought the right products, we wouldn't have this disaster of the environment today. You chose not to buy them. You chose to have your iPhones, your military technology. You chose to fly here. You chose the car to drive, so on and so forth. So it pushes everything back onto the individual. It ignores power and structure in society, basically. It's an individualistic model. The challenge, then, is to redefine freedom. It's one of the first challenges that we have in the kind of, these kind of communities, in the degrowth and the ecological economics community. The conflict between the individual and society is the heart of this. And this is something that, again, comes up in different economic and social systems. So you have different ways of addressing this. How do we deal with the individual versus society? We're all in a room coordinated, right? How come all you guys are sitting in the seats there, very quietly listening to me? Why aren't you all rioting, jumping up and down on the seats, running around, doing whatever, right? Because there's, cert there's certain conventions, norms. You know what situation you're in. There's institutions of the way that we uh, actually coordinate ourselves. So we have in society a whole range of institutions and structures that actually enable us to do social coordination. Those take away your freedoms. Right? They take away certain types of freedom. So you do not have the freedom to run around here naked. Well, you can if you want. But, you, you know, those are the conventions. You won't do it, right? So. But let me take an example like freedom to have a car. So Americans are very attached to their cars along with many other nations today. So we've got to have a car. You can't take away my car. Australians the same. What is a car ownership? I mean, a car is an object that is defined within certain restrictions. There are certain conventions about it. There's certain speed limits. There are certain conventions about which side of the road you can drive, where you can drive it, how you can drive it, whether you can drive it, whether you have a license to drive it. Right? All these things are defined and controlled within society. So this idea that the West, you know, the West was, is freedom and you can buy a car and do what you like is absolute rubbish. Of course you can't. It's defined within a set of institutional contexts. So what we need to do is make this more explicit. You know, Eastern Europe seems to think that they lived in a system where they were under total control in a way that is so different fundamentally from the West. Fundamentally, theoretically, it's not different. It's defined in different ways. So we have a world that is, what we want is a world that is not defined by individualism as the ultimate form of freedom, which is what the West has done. Right? Outcompeting others for success, having better cars, better products, better phones than your neighbour. And doing what you want regardless of other people, the ultimate freedom. The most arrogant people, the most uncaring people are the richest people in Western society. Right? The redefinition of freedom also means redefining how people perceive themselves and create their own identities. So it's no small task here. The reason that this is a, a major issue is because you're challenging fundamentally how people have created their personal identities through the clothes they wear, the products they buy, the way they transport, the food they eat. 
right? You want people to be vegetarian because it's a better diet for the world. You're fundamentally challenging everybody who eats meat, for example. You want to get rid of the car. You're challenging what people understand is their freedoms and their identity. What about changing the capital labor ratio? So one of the issues here is, as I face this around the biophysical reality, is that if we want to move away from the use of low entropy resources, you know, reduce the social metabolism of the society, which is the degrowth agenda, then we're going to have to stop, stop using so much material and energy throughput. What this means is that the whole industrialization over the last 200 to 250 years, built around capital machinery, mechanization, computers, cars, tractors, trucks, and robotics, and so on, is all the use of low entropy resources. If we stop, cut down that use of low entropy resources, we're going to rebalance the ratio between capital and labor. You're going to move back to saying that capital is actually not usable, it's overpriced, it has to be restricted, and we're going to have to use more labor. Right? The challenge then is redefining work, what we mean by work. So the return of labor-intensive production is what we would get out of that. You would shift down. You're going to stop using so many you know, big tractors and uh, farm machinery and so on and so forth, construction machinery, and you're going to replace it with labor. So the end of fossil fuel energy usage, for example, would mean rebalancing the bias that we've seen. But the degrowth community and other uh, alternative discourses quite often get caught in the productivist logic that is existing. Right? So the, uh, the productivist logic is that we have a growth economy. We invest. We get output. We increase pr production and productivity. And this gives us more stuff. Why do we, you know, then you get this story is that, well, we've had all this increase in productivity since the Second World War or whenever, and what we've done is we still work harder. Why don't we take more leisure time? This is all within the productivist growth economy. If you deconstruct the, the, the growth economy and the productivity of it, you will reverse the capital labor bias, and you will no longer have that productivity growth, which is not productivity growth, it's exploitation of low entropy resources. That's what it is cheap fossil fuels and minerals. What this means is that there will not be more leisure time. There will not be more time to be shared out unless you actually reduce the amount of type of things you're producing as well. Right? So you can't just have more productivity in a, in a non-productive economy, which is not the traditional growth economy. So the same output will require more labor in the future. Some things cannot be produced because you will not have the technologies, the fossil fuel economy technologies and ability to produce them. And some things should not be produced anyway because we have to start questioning, what are we doing with these things? Well, what is the consumption for? So a world that is not defined by productivism and materialism, too often the alternative discourse gets caught back into a productivist materialist discussion and makes assumptions that are inappropriate to a future economy that is not a productivist one. Changing material and energy throughput. What materials and energy will we use in the future? Where are they going to come from? If we want to stop the kind of exploitation and imperialism that is currently going on, the militarization, the land grabbing, the going into Africa and South America, destabilizing countries to make sure you can extract their resources for your multinational corporations. If you want to stop all that, then where are you going to get your resources from? What if your region doesn't have those resources? So, you know, the environmental movement is very keen on localization, but there's an issue about how, where you get your resources from. Are we going to have national grids? The green economy in Germany is very much about maintaining the system and changing absolutely nothing in the system, maintaining a massive national grid and bringing in new technologies to maintain massive energy flows. But where does, where does all the uh, materials come from in the first place? How do we get these? So we have questions around this. And then the challenge in redefining energy use. What are we using the energy for? Energy demand is almost sacrosanct. We're not allowed to question energy demand. Very rarely does it get questioned. What about all these uses we have? We know what's efficient, the efficient economy. We're talking about efficiency in, in economics all the time. It's supply efficiency. There's nothing about demand efficiency, consumption efficiency. You know, Hummer V, what's efficient about driving a Hummer? What's efficient about a, an SUV? What's efficient about Formula One racing? 
I mean, going round and round in circles, burning rare fossil fuels and creating the climate change, what for? So people can stare there, oh, oh look, it's going faster. <laughs> and then there's the military, right? The whole military industrial complex. Okay, all these weapons of mass destruction that we're creating all the time so that we can just point it at people. Well, your my weapon's bigger than your weapon. You know, I mean, God. Pretty male stuff. And then there's the whole thing with the climate change, right? If the Paris Agreement is serious, if the Paris Agreement wants to achieve the two-degree target, it will have to start dividing up the remaining fossil fuels. That means that there is a limited budget for carbon and other greenhouse gases to be emitted into the upper atmosphere. We have already exceeded the two-degree target, the Paris two-degree target. They don't talk about it, right? It's already been exceeded. So you look at how are we going to divide up this budget. It means that the reserves that we have today, why are we exploring for more reserves all the time? We have three to four times the reserves we can possibly burn to hit the two-degree target with something like a 60% chance. Okay? The 60% chance is almost gone. So we're now talking about alternative fracking, all these new types of going into the Arctic, so on and so forth. This is geopolitics. It's because nation states want to burn the resources. If you look at it on a historical or an equity basis, both China and the United States have no rights to burn any more fossil fuels, to release any more gases into the upper atmosphere. Right? So there's, that's the fundamental environmental constraint. Paris is therefore not serious. It doesn't face up to any biophysical reality. What it promises is, in the future, there will be a technology that will save the planet. That's what it says. Redefining trade and international relationships. What is the position of the alternative community and degrowth on trade? Quite often, I mean, we look at the, the trade system and we want to deconstruct it. The trade system is also heavily related to the military power and multinational corporations and they've pushed through a whole bunch of institutions. Environmentalists counter this by talking about local produce, bioregionalism, and turning back to the local. But as Yogas mentioned yesterday, what we need is multi-level governance. You can't, uh, you can't ignore the structures in human society. The social structures and the realities are that you will need to actually deal with other regions. You will have you know, cities dealing with the countryside, and regions dealing with other regions, and nations dealing with other nations, and, international problems and you will have uh, things you know, go across borders and so on and so forth. So you have to have some idea of what is the trade relationship. This is a missing element. I think there's a gap in the whole discussion here. You either get the, we're going local and we're anti the international or, or, you, or you get the international and they're not concerned about the local. Changing the density of human habitation. Can we maintain these cities? The cities are a massive draw on energy and resources. The world's population is moving into cities, right? The rural areas are being depopulated. China is building cities, purposefully building cities, shifting people forcefully into the cities, okay? That requires a massive amount of transportation of energy and, and fuel and resources to maintain the city, the, the social metabolism of the city. So what's the alternative? How do you shift away from that? Do we go to eco-villages? What should be the density of the of of size of a town or a city or a community? These kinds of discussions are not happening. All we get is smart cities. What is smart about a city based on technologies, computers, feedback mechanisms? It doesn't actually address anything of the biophysical reality I've been discussing or the social or military issues where the resources are coming from. <laughs> Communications. Everybody in this room, I suppose, has a mobile phone. No, Uli's here. I know he's here. There's at least one person who doesn't. Two, three, four, five, six. Ah, oh, six out of about 400. Great. It's a good start. But there you go. Changing communication. So you all have mobile phones. You've all bought into the military industrial complex. You're all connected to the American system via satellites. And this is something that if you're serious about getting away from fossil fuels, you're serious about saving the environment, you're serious about moving away from low entropy resources, then you have to think about it, right? So these mobile phones have changed your lifestyle. They've become embedded in your personal identity. 
This is one of the impacts of the satellite technology powering your mobile phones. The planet is surrounded by debris, right? You're putting up these satellites so that you can call each other from one side of the room to the other. Redefining the role of technology. The interesting thing I find in these discussions is that if you talk about changing society or making social changes, people say, oh, that's awful. Oh, you must be a communist. Oh, you're a totalitarian dictator. Oh, something like that, right? And yet, you can introduce a technology which fundamentally changes the way that people even talk to each other across a table with no problem at all. And you change the way that people interact, the way they think about community, what they think about community, and you allow all their relationships to be mediated by multinational corporations and an industrial military complex. Right? And that seems to be no problem at all. So, our connected world. Where have you been? No email. You didn't text me. Not a clue on your blog. You didn't update your status on Facebook. It's like you fell off the face of the earth. <laughs> Did you check Twitter? <laughs> Oops, sorry. Upstairs to the bathroom back in five minutes. <laughs> and democracy. I'm almost there. A fundamental change in the power relationships in society. We've heard yesterday the problems of democracy, that democracy is failing, that, that uh, people who thought democracy was going to be great are, are finding out that actually Western society is controlled by a power elite and it's not that much different than other societies, totalitarian societies and so on and so forth. The big question is in a certain society, who gets to control the resources and how? Who sets the limits? Because there are limits, right? That's the point of my discussion about society and freedom and the individual. Who enforces the limits? It's not just about setting up regulations and never enforcing them. We have plenty of those, right? So who actually enforces the limits as well? And this is about the structure of society and democracy. Degrowth is not inherently democratic, right? You can imagine a fascist dictatorship being very happy with degrowth. Social, national socialism could have gone down a degrowth route. Yes, it could, because look what they have. Blood and soil, return to the land, conservative values, shutting the borders by a regionalism. Right? There's lots of correspondences which are actually, they could be seen as being scary or dangerous, but they could also be turned around and be seen as an advantage. As we were discussing yesterday, there's a lot of countries in which the right is making inroads into people due to their fears, concerns, their loss of their values, the deconstruction of their societies and their communities. They don't have to go down the right-wing route. They can go an alternative route. But it means reconstructing de democracy in a different way, not the democracy we have today, which is not very democratic, right? The representative democracy. What is the role of the state comes up here? So we have state structures, and as was discussed yesterday, the state structures are captured quite often by multinational corporations or other vested interests. How do we prevent totalitarian dictatorship in an alternative society? And how is multi-level governance advanced? These are all fundamental questions. So political scientists sitting on the panel yesterday, these are fundamental political science issues as well. Right? And how will multinational corporations be controlled? If you look at the world today, the multinational corporation is an extremely powerful institution in society. They're buying up so many of the little producers, shutting down, controlling governments, extracting resources, and so on. They are undemocratic institutions. They operate outside of dem democratic control, and they need to be deconstructed. To conclude, Growth is based on low entropy resource exploitation. Right? Modern industrial society requires low entropy mineral and fossil energy resources. Externalities, as economists discuss them, are not external. Material and energy use creates pollution, disrupts ecosystems, functions, impacts human health and non-human animals. Technology introduces a range of new substances and materials into the environment with unpredictable social and environmental results. Green growth is traditional economic growth with superficial green trimmings. It does not address the fundamental social, ecological, and economic problems we face. 
Faith remains in a utopian vision, right, of an ever-expanding happiness. We're always going to be more happy. It turns humans into pleasure-seeking hedonists. So we're always told that we can have more happiness. We need an alternative utopian vision. So all the visions of society or the futurity are utopian, and we need an alternative one. We have gross social inequity and stability are not, are not addressed by green growth. So the green growth model is all about exploitation of resources and the same imperialism that we've had in the past. It continues to exploit people and resources and it goes around in this rhetoric of globalization and competition. And as I point out, competition there's, is always backed by the military and real competition is military might. Right? So macroeconomics and the economic picture does not address power or politics. Power and politics were removed from economics 100 years ago. But at the same time, it supports an industrial military complex and a very particular drive of technology and a race for leadership within that military industrial complex. So what we need is an alternative, a social ecological economics, a call for a radically different economics and society, rethinking growth, consumerism, and capital, capital accumulation, prioritizing social inequity, poverty, and injustice, redistributing and balancing power within democracy, rejuvenating democratic institutions and processes, articulating environmental values in their broadest sense, not reducing things down to capital, respecting nature rather than regarding it as just a resource to be exploited. There's a lot, of, a lot of different issues here. Um, the, the middle classes, okay. If we want to address both the, the global issue and also uh, communicate more widely, who do you want to get to? The middle classes or the mass of the world's population, which is the 80% of people who are in poverty? Why do we want to have Nicholas Stern as an elitist going to Davos talking to the middle classes in India, the few hundred million? because we're in a hierarchical power structure, because we like that structure, because we think that's important, because we think there's no other way to change society but to work within the structures we've already got. What I'm asking for is not to reinvent the structures that we already have, to actually put everything back into the market system, the elitist system, to put the wheels back on the collapsing capitalist economy, the hierarchical system with the elite and the rich and famous people and the people of Oxford and Cambridge and uh, the likes of Sen and Stern with all their rhetoric of ethics and poverty and well-meaning language while they live in luxury and fly all over the world telling people about how they should change their lifestyles and that we need a different society. The, the thing here is if you want to change the world then you should talk to the world not to the elite. That's what I would say. That means getting back to the majority of the people, the 80% of the people. And this also addresses the issue about consumption, right? The consumer society. You say, well, these people haven't had the consumption yet, therefore they don't need to degrow. This is a very similar argument, I feel, to the one about environmentalism. We haven't destroyed the environment yet so that we can rebuild it. We have to destroy the environment first, then we can rebuild it when we're rich enough that we can afford the environment that we had originally. Yeah? Right? So we've got to grow, learn that consumption is useless, does nothing for our lifestyles, makes us unhappy, so that we can then go back to the life we had before where we actually realize that we've lost a lot of the values. But no, you can't go back. Because you can't go back. You can only go forwards, right? So where are we going forwards to? This is the point. And the other point about this is that not everybody can have it. It's a lie. It's a fundamental lie. That's the whole point of my biophysical reality relationship here. You will not have all the people in the world living of the American lifestyles, even of the poorest American at the threshold level. It will not happen because you cannot exploit those resources. You cannot get them cheap enough. You cannot get the fossils out of the ground without fucking up everything, the planet and so on and so forth. Right? So... Is India going to have another military invade uh, into Pakistan 
Are they going to set up a military the size of uh, America? Is China going to invade uh, Africa? Are the Russians coming in through the Caucasus are going to take over Eastern Europe again? I mean, that's what you get if you want to go down the route of the traditional growth society. So it's not inclusive. And it's not about addressing the needs of the middle class. And it's not about giving people consumption and so on and so forth. The point also with the capital labor economy is not that we need to do anything to enforce the capital labor ratio. It will be enforced. The point is that when you use up fossil fuel resources, as oil runs out, you will not have cheap plastics. You will not have machinery. You will not have people able to mow their lawn with fossil fuels and so on and so forth. It will change. It will go. It is a basic reality. You don't have to enforce this re reversal of capital labor ratio. That is what the future is. Right, so uh, advertising. Advertising is interesting, right? So uh, this is also relates a little bit to your concern where, you know, should we, should we address children? Advertisers address children, and they get them very early now, right? They, they're pushing products onto them from an extremely early age. So advertising is used in all sorts of ways. If the state tries to actually do any campaign about saving something, doing something, whatever, that's propaganda. If a multinational corporation gets a four-year-old child addicted to sweets or a phone or gaming, that's just freedom in the marketplace, right? So there's a really serious problem, I think, with advertising and the way advertising is used and the way advertising has become regarded in society. Advertising was actually heavily restricted at one time because of subliminal advertising. It was also restricted from films and so on, and all that has gone backwards with neoliberalism. So the restrictions on advertising have gone the other way. Products are all over the place, right, being pushed all the time. 